Welcome to Peace Learning Parenting. It's a pleasure to have with me today Dr. Monica Shahbaznia. We will be discussing the shootings of Colorado. Uh, first, let's take a look at this clip and an overview of what's happened this past week. And then we'll be back discussing the psychological implications. Stay with us. His criminal record, nothing more than a speeding ticket. He was a PhD candidate with a mother who has experience as a mental health professional. So much of the Aurora shooting suspect's profile doesn't seem to fit the destruction he unleashed in that theater. And ABC's Brian Ross now has the latest on James Holmes. When the mother of James Holmes was reached at her San Diego home today and first told what had happened overnight, she expressed little surprise. You have the right person, she told ABC News. I need to call the police. Authorities said today the planning for the theater attack began at least two months ago when Holmes purchased the first two guns of his arsenal at Denver area stores, passing the required background checks. In the last 60 days, he purchased four guns at local Metro gun shops, and through the internet, he purchased over 6,000 rounds of ammunition. It was over the last few months that Holmes, who was Phi Beta Kappa in college, saw his academic and career dreams collapse as he withdrew from a PhD program in neuroscience at the University of Colorado's Denver campus. I think the motive is, is his life has continued to collapse for, I bet, a number of months or maybe even a few years. And as his issues with perhaps delusion, paranoia, got greater, he just couldn't deal with what was going on around him. Holmes grew up in a prosperous San Diego community called Rancho Penasquitos. This was Holmes just six years ago, called Jimmy, a clean-cut 5'11 high school senior, a member of the junior varsity soccer team at Westview High School. That's where it made me think about the times that he was like picked on in class. He was just that person who always was smirking. One former classmate remembered Holmes as the class bully, but others in his neighborhood said he was just a classic loner. He was just quiet. He was just quiet. Unable to find a job, Holmes moved to Colorado last fall and appeared to be nothing more than a quiet and easygoing graduate student. But it was a different Jim Holmes who showed up at this San Diego pawn shop, where the owner says Holmes sought tips on firing the guns he had planned to use. We carry all of those firearms in stock. Very specifically remember James Holmes' face. Last night, neighbors at his Aurora apartment building said they heard loud techno music coming from his apartment, with the recorded sounds of gunshots added in. Holmes was already at the theater at the time. What's odd is what, what really brought up the red flags for us is the apartment complex is very quiet. There's no noise, nothing. And then all of a sudden, you know, yesterday night or midnight this morning, music starts up out of nowhere. That was kind of odd because no one throws parties in that apartment. And then Holmes apparently attempted to make himself into the Joker character of the Batman series, according to a briefing given to the New York City Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly. He had his hair uh, painted uh, red. He said he was uh, the Joker. He's a guy that has so left reality that he now is in this, this make-believe world that he's part of the Batman world and that he's going to go in and play this character and through that character he's going to kill people. Police say Holmes told them he was extremely calm throughout the evening because he had taken the powerful painkiller Vicodin about two hours before the attack. His final step, police say, was to booby trap his apartment, which they say was so full of chemicals and incendiary devices that it may be days before the bomb squad can figure out how to defuse them. I see an awful lot of wires, trip wires, jars full of ammunition, jars full of liquid, some things, things that look like mortar rounds. We have a lot of challenges to get in there safely. As with all mass shootings, victims and their families are left wondering why. Experts say in such cases, parents often know without specifics that something is wrong. In so many of these shootings that have happened before, we've seen that they are carried out by people who are really at a point of desperation, who felt they may have had no other options left. Today, his father, Robert, a software engineer, left the family home in San Diego under police protection to fly to Colorado to see his son. Police say they are certain Holmes acted alone, but there remains concern tonight there could be so-called copycats, others who would try to do the same thing at other movie theaters, Bill. So what sort of steps are they taking? Well, in Aurora, for instance, the police chief says he's been contacted. 
The Colorado shooting, James Holmes, a little boy perhaps years ago who uh, maybe perhaps because of being shy or because of uh, having poorness of fit in the family fell off the track and developmentally grew up to be this, this person who now calls himself the Joker. And many families are suffering from this loss. And it's a sad tragedy. Dr. Monica Shabaznia, welcome to the program. Thank you. We want to know why. Me. Why? Why is this happening? What do you think? What are some psychological implications that uh, help us understand, you know, uh, the psych psychological uh, reasons for, for this? You know, I think that um, a lot of the calls that I get from a lot of parents are uh, attributed to their children's uh, problems with behavior and so forth. And I always, um, it's important to be able to root out what is a, just a brief, you know, little issue that the, you know, children or teenagers or young adults may be having with their behavior. And then there's another thing to really be able to look at certain things that I think that the media is not discussing. Um, which is mental illness and how that is related to the situation or how it could be related to the situation. Uh, in this case, well, there's so much that we haven't learned about James Holmes. Mm -hmm. But let's assume that, as you were saying, that he did have a childhood with some uh, problems, uh, maybe in upbringing and whatnot. But maybe there were certain things that could have been identified early on, such as a conduct disorder. You know, and what is conduct disorder? Conduct disorder is something that um, starts at early childhood, and it is where children are very um, disrespectful, um, have no regard for authority. Their teachers, their parents, rules at home. Um, anything that has to do with um, respect towards others. Sometimes they even uh, set fires, they wet their bed, they injure animals, they are bullies in school. Um, there's so much, uh, you know, uh, lies, manipulation, trying to get something for their own benefit by lying. Um, and this can certainly, over the years, lead to something that we that is also called antisocial personality disorder. Um, antisocial personality disorder, sometimes people feel that means that they're shy, they're not social. Uh, but uh, completely different. Antisocial means that you're against society, that you have no regard for the norms of the protection and personal safety of others. So. Uh, because of your own anger or brewing problems, because perhaps you didn't get the treatment or uh, positive parenting, peaceful parenting from the beginning, uh, you might start to really truly develop something that can over time uh, become criminally um, uh, problematic, criminal behavior. Um, so again, uh, damage to property, damage to others, um, assault. Um, and, uh, and, and not all of these things are very blatant. Remember that sometimes because of this is happening, a lot of these children, teenagers, and young adults um, are, are marginalized, are set aside. Um, their teachers you know, are concerned about them. That they're not making real good friends very easily because they have a hard time really making a connection. So your recommendation is pay attention to the early signs early intervention, getting help at the early stages. Uh, but, but for a child who's already uh, getting in trouble at school, mm -hmm. you know, having issues with, with learning or um, uh, the friendships and, yeah. you know. So, so what we do know about James Holmes, uh, the, the, the information that we do have, we don't know if he has had a criminal record, if he's uh, had uh, issues, you right. know, with, with the law or so forth. But we do know that he, according to the friend, he was, uh, called the class bully at one time, one right. point. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, perhaps um, from just his current status, being a loner and uh, not having too many friends, not mm -hmm. being on Facebook, not being on Twitter, you know, right. totally uh, being isolated. 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 We, we, we can tell that perhaps, you know, I'm always interested from, from a temperament's perspective. Yeah. What James Holmes, uh, as a child, as a little baby, what did mm -hmm. he, you know, Absolutely. who was he? It would be my guess that he probably was uh, a shy boy. And, you know, from his mannerism and all the feedback that the friends have mm -hmm. been, uh, mm -hmm. you know, giving regarding his um, 
just being quiet, more quiet, more shy to himself. And perhaps he was in an environment where, where his parents, uh, maybe mom was a little more bold, maybe, you know, dad, maybe they were more extroverted. Uh, I, I can just, and I don't know if he has any siblings, you know, I, I, I'm curious to know. But what did that home, that early environment look like? It, it's my guess that it, there was poorness of fit. Because for a child, to be raised in an environment where there is goodness of fit, mm -hmm. where mom and dad are attuned to their child's yeah. inner state, there is absolutely no way you can raise a child who will turn out to be, unless they're like serious, serious, serious genetic and you know uh, biochemical. Absolutely. Uh, uh, um, Roots. Right. And we need to look at the family psychiatric history, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We need to look at that. And also the perfect storm. You know, this sort of like all the planets are aligned sometimes for good and wonderful things. You know, you have children who are receptive to their parents wanting to be good parents. And all of the parenting skills that go along with that. And then at the same time, the child is very curious about life and has all these um, positive attributes that allow the child to really make positive friends, feel connected mm -hmm, within mm -hmm, their classroom, mm -hmm. feel connected within their little league or their soccer game or whatever. And in this case, I'm willing to bet that there was a, also the planets were aligned up in, in, in the perfect way that set it up so that this kid, and unfortunately this young man, had a major problem. Mm -hmm. And I will also say here, there's a lot of shame involved. Uh, sometimes with families who have a child who has a conduct disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, because you don't want to bring him to the restaurant because he starts screaming or sure. he starts having a problem or he runs away. You, you, a lot of families just keep them, uh, you know, from going to birthday parties so they're not really being able to socialize. And instead of teaching them the whole social, you know, how to socialize properly, a lot of times it doesn't happen. And look, if we're looking at parents that have had major problems with it, it themselves or somewhere along the line, there's been a family with addiction, uh, a family that has had problems with, um, you know, any kind of uh, conflict. You know, they're, they're going to have a hard time maybe saying, this is my opportunity to parent my child. Here is a perfect opportunity to take this kid and be able to speak with this kid. So we, we know he, he, he's brilliant. We know that he probably has a high IQ for being you know, the, the, the PhD student at a neuroscience, uh, neuroscience yeah. program, right? Mm -hmm. We know that he's been socially isolated. He has not had uh, too many friends. Right. We know that he's been interested in Batman and this whole yeah. story of of a child who witnesses his parents die and this severe loss in early childhood and he identifies with the Joker. You know, he calls That's himself how, the Joker. Exactly. He dyes his, uh, his hair red. He is the Joker. And for him to, to, to enter this story or to uh, retell or reorganize his life story in a way that he has this history of loss, this history of... I, I believe he probably identifies with Batman and Joker. I think Absolutely. the Batman is the part of him that empowers him, gives him power. Here's a man who's been experiencing his life, like we heard in the um, clip, you know, his life has been collapsing one thing after another. But more importantly, the emotional bank mm -hmm. you know he, he's 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 uh, bankrupt you know he's at a point where he ha has no sense of empathy no empathy no regard for others and my assumption here is i don't think that he would have been able to get through college and get into a doctorate program for this period of time if he had had psychotic features throughout mm -hmm. i think he must have had a brief psychotic episode that has led to something and it was his only alternative, his only way out as he saw it, mm -hmm. as he saw it, because there's many people who would just say, look, you know, I need treatment. I need help. I'm not well. I'm going to reach out to my family. Did he reach out? I wonder, you know, in this clip that we just showed, uh, the uh, police uh, called the family's house in San Diego and said, look, we have this, uh, your son you know, and she said, you have the right man. She knew. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She knew. And that is what we need to be able to work as a village. But at the same time, so much that we know about others that have done the same. So, you know, starting from other mm -hmm. um, a criminal behavior that has boggled the American conscience, from Jeffrey Dahmer to the, uh, you know, the, the shooters at Columbine. Uh, all of these things, all of these young people that have done things that are atrocious and heinous, and we're looking at as to why. Mm -hmm. And that is why it's important to really, truly discuss mental illness and to be able to identify. And I really feel that if at least, if, if we as psychologists, as parents, as law enforcement, pediatricians, teachers, healers, everybody, mm -hmm. can truly understand conduct disorder, truly understand how it can lead to then antisocial personality disorder and how that is involved with um, something that could cause a brief psychotic episode or break. Um, we, we could definitely be able to figure out why does the human being make such decisions off, you know, without, without really, reali without making how can I say, without sticking to the um, social norms. Again, like I've, I really feel that it is uh, under, misunderstood, it's under treated, it's under diagnosed. I think a lot of times we have this whole thing about attention deficit disorder. We see that a lot. We see a lot of learning disabilities. But what we don't really hear about too much is the, the third piece of it. And a lot of times these, these two come with a third companion called conduct disorder. And conduct disorder starts, um, you know, you start seeing the signs of this at probably about age two toddler years. And what we really want to look at is this concept of, you know, attachment, temperament. What's going on with this child? You know, I see a lot of parents who want to know why this child is having such massive tantrums beyond age three, you know, really being um, defiant, cannot self-soothe, cannot find a way to uh, truly be able to behave themselves when their parents are asking them to. If this is left alone, and if we don't really understand the concept of insecure attachment or ambivalent attachment and what those things are, and we can probably talk a little bit about how to define that, um, then I feel that this can snowball into something pretty big. In Peace Learning Parenting Program, I talk about the five C's. I talk about uh, compassion, communication, mm -hmm. cooperation, culture, right. and conservation. That's right. And it's really important uh, when I talk about uh, how to integrate the five in your daily routine yes. connection with your child as a parent. And I uh, lecture educators and I talk to teachers and I say it's really, really important for you to understand that like you say, we are cooperating, right. we are in this together, yes. it does take a village. Yes. And the homeschool connection could be one of the most crucial ones mm -hmm. because that's when we see early intervention. That's when we see the early signs and together with mom, dad, and teachers, you can come up with a successful plan that leads to your child Absolutely. becoming uh, that whole child who is connected with their inner self, who is right. able to attach securely and feel secure and safe, who is compassionate, who is empathetic towards others, mm -hmm. and who does show a genuine, authentic interest in bringing peace to the world. And I see this on a daily basis. I see this in preschools. I've experienced this with my own children, and it is possible. Absolutely. Th th there, there is definitely hope on this um, effort and really raising awareness. You know, we do need to raise awareness on mental illness. My perspective has shifted uh, from a more uh, pathological position to a more uh, developmental perspective. I'm really, really interested, as you mentioned, in the field of attachment, temperament. How do we uh, create successful environments to raise children who are securely attached and who are able to organize and connect 
to the outside world in a healthy way. And it all starts from the very beginning. Absolutely. I see children, spirited kids who are placed in environments where moms and dads are too punitive, they're too harsh, they're too strict, they're too controlling. And next thing you know, this wonderful, beautiful, spirited child is now turned into someone with conduct disorder. That's right. Because they they weren't understood. Or or they they lose their luster because a particular teacher, preschool teacher, kindergarten teacher, somebody has squelched their spirit. Mm -hmm. Has mm -hmm. squelched their spirit to the extent that now they are really truly feeling like they cannot laugh and play and scream and, and, and have the exuberance. Right that they you know really truly have in their spirit and in their heart yeah now th there are certain things that also are like certain parameters that are wonderful for parents to be able to set like limits and boundaries and uh and those are really good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i think a lot of a lot of parents they were like well they don't want to rein in their child's spirit but at the same time this is not about reining in no, child no, spirit no. this no. is a really truly about acknowledging, celebrating your child's spirit, celebrating your child's curiosity and love and compassion, and as you said, really connection to their culture and language yeah. and all yeah. these wonderful things, but setting limits as far as rules, regulations, understanding that there are consequences. If you hurt someone, what does their pain feel like? I think that we also need to look at the factor of, of the IQ, mm -hmm. so in the intelligence mm -hmm. quotient, mm -hmm. versus or in, in line with emotional yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Because th those two are totally different things. You mm -hmm. could be academically successful. Mm -hmm. You can go through grade school and high school and just get really good grades because you understand the system. And to, to manipulative persons, people who do have antisocial personality disorder, if they really truly want to get to a goal, they'll get it. They'll figure out a way of, on how to get the A. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But emotional intelligence, how to understand the consequences, pain, the pain that others might be feeling, how to really be able to be there to be compassionate and even self-compassionate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to be okay with yourself and say, you know what, I'm having a really hard day. I need help. I need support. I need a hug. You know, those things that are important. Um, but that's what that's what I think we're talking about is is children who have insecure who are insecurely attached mm -hmm. or ambivalently attached and what that means for I think the, the audience to understand attachment mm -hmm. is is for little kids you know three six months you know nine months one year if mom leaves the room and they don't even care they're still playing with their toys they don't follow mom they don't have that that eye that kind of goes along with mom they just They'll go with any adult, it doesn't matter, they don't care. Or the child who is just absolutely attached to mom, won't let go, is absolutely fearful all the time. You know, on those two extremes that we're talking about, that is going to lead to having problems, as you said, regulating, figuring out the, the, the right kind of flow in the middle to really be able to make friends, to feel connected, to feel like they're making an impact in the world mm -hmm. that's a peaceful one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about this Joker identity. Mm -hmm. Because he says, I'm the Joker. That's the only thing he shared with us. Yeah. The reason we're discussing this right now is because we're still trying to figure it out. We are still as a society trying to figure it out. And the other thing too that I think that is really harsh when it comes to little kids is that all the little kids right now who are like 10 years old have only known us to be in war. And that's a really tremendous uh, sort of back strain. Yeah, it is, I think it is. it's a tough yeah. one. And so when we talk about that, it's, it's sometimes it, it might be um, challenging, I think, for a lot of families to discuss peaceful parenting. Because in general, when you talk about the context of where we are, we're, right now we are in a war and we forget that. Yeah. And you know, they always say it's, it's not the gun, it's the man holding the gun, you know. And I understand and that's, you know, why I think that we need to have a lot more intervention. You know, we have in the health field, we have a law that protects the identity of patients. It's a HIPAA law. And uh, if you are a patient, you can consult with your physician and know that your physician isn't going to tell the world about what your concerns are or what your diagnosis is for any reason other than legal or ethical necessity. But in this case, I truly see it as an ethical issue. I, f I know for a fact that if there is domestic violence, uh, a, 
uh, domestic violence call, um, all weapons in that house are confiscated, and uh, whoever is being um, accused of the uh, of the violence, their weapons are taken away from them, even if they're police officers. So we have to be able to say, look, if we have someone with antisocial personality disorder who's beating up his wife, who's abusing his children, who's um, you know threatening. They might go away for what we call a 72-hour hold, a psychiatric hold, but are their guns taken away? So mental illness of this caliber, okay, psychiatric breaks of this caliber that James Holmes had, did anybody say, did that mother, when she said, you've got the right guy, Here. And mm -hmm. a lot of people fall through that. And criminal behavior, you know, and criminals mm -hmm. with manipulative minds who know how to work the system, again, who know how to work the system, mm -hmm. will find the guns mm -hmm. in the black market, whatnot. So they're not necessarily going to stores and buying them with their ID or gun shows. Um, at the same time, we all, we know that not all of the dealers at the gun shows are properly, you know, running background checks as they should. So, so again, um, it's a, um, there's a lot of allowance and, and there's only one question. Did you know that there's only one question on the form that's a federal and state application for gun ownership? It says, have you ever been involuntarily committed for a mental illness? And all you have to do is check no and go on to the next question. Mm -hmm. So no yeah. one's checking you. Got so, an issue you know. with that. <laughs> the same way, you know, I think uh, it would be great to have some kind of a requirement or, I don't know, uh, to give um, uh, incentives to parents who complete yeah. parenting courses. Yes. You know, uh, it, it's all early intervention. Yeah. You, if, you, if you pay attention to these minor details, <laughs> I think you, you will be better off in the long term. Yes. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Monica, thank for joining you. us. Thank it's you for having me. It's a pleasure to thank see you. you. And um, uh, we will be back uh, next week, perhaps, to talk more about the early signs of violence, aggression, insecure attachment, disorganized attachment, all those things that you parents want to know so that you can help your children and raise children who are interested in peace and peace for all. So thank you for joining us until next week. Bye.